first, and there you go. Okay, so good morning. My name is Josh Blackman, and I am the uh, president of Harlan Institute. Uh, today we are here for the Harlan Institute Consource Virtual Supreme Court Competition. We are discussing the case of Zivitowski v. Carey, and we are dealing with Oswego High School in Oregon. And arguing for the petitioner will be Diana, and arguing for the respondent will be Amos and Max. Uh, Diana, whenever you're ready, you may proceed. Good morning. My name is Diana Oppenheimer, and I speak on behalf of the petitioner, Mr. Zivotofsky. The issue before the Supreme Court is over the constitutionality of Section 214B of the Foreign Relations Authorization Act. This gives American citizens born in Jerusalem the ability to change their place of birth to Israel on United States passports and consular reports of birth abroad. We submit that the statute is constitutional for two main reasons. Firstly, the statute 214B does not qualify as formal recognition of Israel's claim to Jerusalem. Instead, we argue that it is, the statute is a constitutional application of Congress's exclusive authority over naturalization and citizenship. But also, that the changes that would be possible to make under the statute do not constitute U.S. foreign policy. Our second main point is that the recognition power is not exclusive to the executive. And for these reasons, we state these reasons, that the framers intended for Congress to have oversight over the executive's conduct in foreign affairs, and that the sole organ doctrine used to support the executive branch's ability to broadly define presidential power in foreign relations and national security, free from judicial or legislative constraints, has been misinterpreted. Also, post-gratification history supports the existence of an inherent, not an exclusive, executive recognition power. In this, we draw a distinction between powers the president possesses that, though unauthorized, will still be regulated by statute, called inherent powers, and powers that are beyond congressional control, called exclusive powers. Finally, the tripartite test described in one sound sheet from two company, the employer, affirms the constitutionality of the passport statute. Okay, Counselor, if I may ask the, uh, the first question. Um, why should the Supreme Court be getting involved in this sort of issue? Isn't this a sort of political dispute that is best resolved by Congress and the President? Why should judges be deciding such a case of such important foreign policy significance? The most simple answer to your question is that in the case preceding this one, the Batofsky v. Clinton, the court ruled that this was not purely a political question, that they would go on it in the Supreme Court. But a better, more in-depth answer to your question is that this issue over recognition has, uh, is important to the separation of powers between the U.S. Congress and the President. As with every other presidential power, the recognition power requires a check which Congress can provide. So, so Counselor, I have a question for you as well uh, with respect to your opening here. So you said that the uh, founder's intent confirms the interpretation of the recognition power that you're alleging here. Can you uh, tell us uh, how you are sort of discerning what this intent is? Well, our main point for that is that in writing the Constitution, the founders were reluctant to grant the president too much power to avoid creating a monarch. And while under the Articles of Confederation, the power to uh, receive diplomats, that did actually belong to Congress. And that, in our mind, in the transfer of power from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution, it is unlikely that the founders would then take this power, which the Constitution power has been extrapolated from, and give it solely to the President without any congressional check. This is confirmed uh, with writings by Joseph Story and Madison, who both assert that recognition um, has implications on matters of peace and war in a country. And for that reason, the 
power to declare war falls on the congressional control. It follows that the recognition power, Congress should have some say in the recognition power. And, and what's the citation on the on the Madison source for that? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand you. I'm sorry. You, you said that this is something that James Madison alleges. At, where does he allege this? In, in what document or at what point during the Constitutional Convention? I'm sorry, I really yeah, the I internet, couldn't it, understand you. The internet's real glitchy for some reason right now. Uh, try one more time. Okay. You mentioned uh, James Madison and his views confirming the interpretation that you are arguing for here. Uh, what you know, document, uh, treatise, essay, or you know, speech uh, does that come from? Uh, this comes from the arguments between Pacificus and Helvidius. Uh, he wrote in Helvidius. And then okay. Jeff Story's point comes from his commentary on the Constitution. Okay. And do you have a, a direct quotation from uh, the uh, Pacificus Helvidius uh, debates that confirms this interpretation? Uh, yes. Madison states that recognition has the possible consequences of laying the legislature under an obligation of declaring war. So if the recognition power is exclusive to the executive, then it creates the possibility that the president could coerce Congress into declaring war. Okay. Very good. Um, Counselor, thank you very uh, much. If, if I could ask you another question. Um, is there an actual recognition power stated anywhere in the text of the Constitution? No, there is not. The recognition power comes from the part of the Constitution that says that the President shall have power to receive diplomats and other foreign ministers. And from this, um, it was taken that in order of receiving diplomats, foreign ministers requires that a country be recognized. Mm -hmm. So, so, so Counselor, if I can ask a follow-up question. If there's nothing clearly written in the text of the Constitution about this recognition power, wouldn't it be safer for the court to assume that this is a power that belongs solely to the executive? I mean, we have, you know, Congress's powers are spelled out very, very directly. Right. Is there anything in the text of the Constitution that should make us think that this is a shared power or that maybe Congress should have a role in it? The two items that the recognition power falls is an executive power. We are not arguing with that. What we do argue with is the idea that it solely belongs to the executive um, for reasons that Recognition has uh, an effect on war, on peace, and on the treaties between countries, and which all fall under congressional authority. The Senate approves treaties and Congress declares war. Mm -hmm. But don't the facts in this case sort of undercut that argument, though, right? The, the, Jerusalem is highly contested territory, right? So, you know, whose sovereign authority this falls under is geopolitically significant. Allowing for Congress to say that if you're born in Jerusalem, you can identify as being born in Israel. Isn't that just going to frustrate the conflict between Israel and Palestine? Doesn't that doesn't that sort of uh, go against what you're arguing here? That if the president was making this decision, it would cause geopolitical strife. Isn't that exactly what Congress is doing here? Oh, we are not arguing that by giving the uh, president some recognition power that would cause geopolitical strife. Um, and we do recognize that this passport act has the potential to cause unrest. However, we would point out that this is an individual choice. It is not representative of the country's entire diplomatic policy because an individual has the option of changing their place of birth if they're born in Jerusalem to Israel on their passport. It's not a requirement for everyone born in Israel. 
Is there also an option that a person who's born in Jerusalem can identify as having been born in Palestine? Only if they're born prior to any specific date. I don't remember what the date is, but no, there is not an act that exists or that would allow that people to believe that Palestine has jurisdiction over Israel. Okay. So I want to move past the factual question, and you also mentioned that some of the post-ratification history, and so I'm assuming here from the first presidential administration, also supports what you're arguing here. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened during the first presidential administration? All right. I think you're referring to Washington's uh, recognition of France. Um, during the French Revolution, during the neutrality crisis of 1792, Washington legitimized the French Revolutionary government without congressional authorization. And though while his actions are notable for being uh, the first establishment of the president's inherent ability to affect foreign policy and use the recognition power, uh, his recognition of France is not proof that the president possesses an exclusive recognition power because Congress did not challenge his actions. On the contrary, they reaffirmed the President's choice with the Neutrality Act of, 19, of 1794, essentially making his decision into law, which implies that Congress at the time was silent, which was passive approval of the President's action, did not directly go against the President in his decision. Okay, and what about in other presidential administrations where there was an agreement between Congress and the president uh, over recognizing a particular foreign authority? Those instances are very rare, which is why this case is coming before the Supreme Court now. Uh, one example we would point to is um, the controversy over Taiwan and its sovereignty, and which uh, government has over it. Um, the, pre in, the president did not recognize Taiwan as being governed by the People's Republic of China or as being self-governed. Um, in response, Congress disagreed with this position, this foreign policy statement. And in response, Congress passed the Taiwan Relations Act. In the act, Congress required that U.S. law recognize Taiwan's legal authority. In addition, the act also created a substitute for ambassadors called the American Institute of Taiwan. So what these provisions did is they treated Taiwan like a self-governing country without officially recognizing the country. That's an example of how when the President and Congress have disagreed, Congress has effective recognition without, in, without infringing too much on the President's ability to enact foreign policy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Counselor, if I can ask a question. The um, ambassador clause you're receiving, it's in Article 2, Section 3. It says, the president shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. What's the impact of that clause in the argument? That would seem to suggest the framers wanted to give the president the power to recognize. Because if you were to receive an ambassador, you have to choose which is the correct country, which is the correct government. So how does the, uh, the uh, ambassador clause impact your argument? Well, I would say that the framers' intent in giving this power to the president was, as Alexander stated, as specific, one of efficiency. And um, origi his original uh, position was that it was a matter of convenience and without con uh, consequence in the administration of government. Now, we recognize today that Yes, this clause does indeed grant the, past, the president the recognition power, although not the sole recognition power. And so it uh, does have consequence in the administration of government. But um, from Alexander Hamilton's initial arguments, uh, we see that in granting this power it was not meant to be a sole power. It was more meant to allow the president to act efficiently and quickly. Okay. okay, thank you, Counselor. Unless Justice Silverbrook, which is a nice ring to it, uh, has, has any more questions, uh, you, you use about 15 minutes and we can save the rest of your time for rebuttal. And then we can hear from the respondents now. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, and respondents, uh, whenever you're ready, uh, the two of you have had 20 minutes to split up, and you can use that time uh, however, you, uh, however you see fit, so as long as both of you are able to uh, present arguments. Okay. Um, Counselor, whenever you're ready to proceed, you may. In the question of whether the President's recognition power is subject to control by Congress, the answer is a definitive no. Due to the extensive precedent of presidential recognition power, a historical ratification of this specific authority is apparent. And looking towards the Implication of the overarching power in this specific case of Zivotofsky v. Gary, the very question of legitimacy is rooted in the creation of Israel as an independent nation, and any encroachment upon the president's authority in this regard would be an encroachment upon Israel's statehood. The implicit power is illustrated in Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution, with the president's power to receive ambassadors and other public bids. The clause subject, uh, the clause subject of the embassy not the clause, uh, this is greater portion of the 20th century we saw was clear with the notable examples of Taiwan, Cuba, and Israel. The power itself is embodied within the Constitution of founders believing in the president's sole power to declare the officialness of recognized foreign entities, dating back to the French Revolution. No specific power of congressional recognition are applied in the Constitution, whereas the president of most luminary executives charged with operating upon principles of weighing the interests of the United States while obeying laws enacted by Congress. So basically, to start things off and address some of the points that are brought up by the petitioner, uh, a few notable things that we have to contest is, first of all, the Congress does have the ability to take actions related to foreign, uh, foreign relations, but the reason why we see that the respondents are so clear in the decision on this side is because we see the issue of Israel and the passive control in this specific incident is not simply about passport control, but rather has national security implications as well. And when it comes to national security, we see that the executive and the president has the utmost authority in dealing with these issues. To quote uh, John, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry himself, the status of Jerusalem is one of the most sensitive flashpoints in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Since 1948, when President Truman recognized the state of Israel, the United States' consistent foreign policy has been to recognize that no state having sovereignty over Jerusalem. To side with the petitioner in this case, as we're advocating for, uh, advocating against, would be to side with the idea that Jerusalem uh, comes under the complete sovereignty of Israel, and in doing so, opens up political floodgates for both conflicts in the Israel, uh, Israeli uh, Arab Peninsula, as well as political issues arising in the United States. So to kind of solidify this as a legal standard that was brought forth by the petitioner, they make this claim that the president can't encroach on Congress's ability to declare war or make matters of peace in regards to this, and this is why in some situations the recognition power needs to be limited. We're going to make the same argument that Congress doesn't have the ability to encroach on the president's power to veto war or approve uh, acts of war and veto peace treaties and approve acts of peace treaties. And in this situation, the Secretary of State, John Kerry, has already precisely articulated that he believes that the reversal of, of the Truman Doctrine and previous foreign policy in regards to Jerusalem's self-determination as, as where it's culturally, uh, culturally placed would lead to a reflection and a reversal of this foreign policy. So we believe in this interest that Congress itself can't force war on the president. And even in the situation where you believe they can, we believe that the Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1995 with the executive waiver that allows the president to postpone moving of the embassy to Jerusalem and moving the capital of Israel to Jerusalem for up to six months, depending on national security uh, measures that can then be extended every six months that the president needs that is necessary. And the fact that this has been extended since 1995 indicates that any power that Congress has over this situation in regards to recognition of Israel has already been ceded to the executive branch. Very good. So, Counselor, thank you very much for your questions. And if I may, um, if I may lead off uh, uh, questions. So your argument primarily seems to be that this is, in, in nature, um, a political question, and then if the court rules in this matter, we'll be uh, wading and intruding into some sort of very difficult separation of powers, national security issue. But didn't we already decide this in 2012? 
didn't worry to side in the case of Zivotofsky v. Clinton, the original case, that this is not a political nature. We, we can decide this issue, and we're back here around two to decide the merits. Uh, I think your counsel, your, your friend Dan on the other side raised this exact point. So didn't we already decide that we can address this question? So there's a couple of responses we have to this. First up, we do agree with the rule in Zivotofsky v. Clinton, but look at we hope we hope you agree with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but more importantly, if we look at like previous rulings in like KBA or Curtis Wright, what we're seeing is the president still has as the sole and the ability to perpetrate or create foreign policy abroad. But we also believe that within the scope of the Constitution itself, through a textual or original interpretation, we're also going to see that recognition power and the ability to conduct foreign affairs primarily through the executive branch is primarily vested within the executive branch. And more importantly, the fact that if the Congress were to interfere like this, this would make it harder and it would interfere with the ability for the executive branch to accurately uh, carry out its job. Uh, citing uh, Article 2, Section 3, it says that the President shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. We interpret the act of receiving as that of recognizing that a country exists. As you previously stated when questioning the petitioner, you have to recognize that a country exists and which country has the political claim to the land. We're articulating that this is an instance in which the recognition power represents itself in the Constitution. Additionally, in Article 2, Section 1, the Constitution says that the executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States of America. We think that the explicit verbiage of the executive power being vested indicates that executive action and powers are given to the president and that all other foreign policy matters are, that the Congress has control over are specifically delineated to them, such as commerce and war, which leaves this interpretation up to the executive branch looking at a textual interpretation of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Counselor, if I can... Oh, sorry, Justice Silver, after you, please. No, no, go ahead. So, Counsel, you said a minute ago that Congress has power over foreign commerce. Isn't a passport an article of foreign commerce? That does come under the realm of foreign commerce, but at the same time, we also have political implications in this specific incident. We're not talking about just anywhere in the world, and this is something that was brought up when uh, speaking with the petitioner and your line of questioning. When we look at the issue of Israel, especially with the conflict we see between Israel as well as other Arab Peninsula states, looking at Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict and the contested uh, city of Jerusalem, we see that the United States currently does identify uh, the overarching political power of Palestine as a terrorist organization. And looking towards that, we see national security implications being a huge factor in this case. And by simply going ahead and stating that this is a foreign commerce case entirely, we're neglecting the fact that we see the issue of national security being something that is uh, really at the root of this conflict and something that we have to address looking at the over-politicization of this specific case. And to provide, oh, go ahead, please. To provide like, legal precedent for this, in the uh, Justice Berger says that the president has confidential sources of information. He has agents in the form of diplomatic, consular, and other officials. Secrecy and respective information gathered by them may be highly unnecessary, and the premature disclosure of harmful results. The claim of the petitioner is that in the circumstance of national security or in the circumstance where the executive branch believes there is foreign interest abroad in maintaining its current foreign policy. We, uh, we believe that the Supreme Court precedent indicates that the executive branch has the right to continue to pursue these, foreign, uh, these actions in foreign policy. Counselor? Counselors, okay. if, if you don't mind, Justice Blackman, too. Uh, yeah, if, if I could ask a question. So, so what you're arguing for as a fairly expansive power for the for the president. I mean, are you arguing essentially that there's no role for Congress in foreign policy? Well, we see that as simply not true. If you look at such example as the National Security Agency and some of the current debates that are had in Congress and uh, in the state capitol concerning the specific agency, we see that Congress does have the necessary recourse to pass legislation that limits the authority of the executive to the president. But if we look to the already, I mean, the precedent that's been set, we see that uh, Congress has not had any precedent for setting a uh, specific uh, blockage of recognition power. We see such examples as Taiwan coming up, but and that specific incident, we also see that, that uh, the decision by the president stems strictly from the inaction of Congress. So what we're doing in ultimately advocating on the respondent side is we see that when we leave the sole power to Congress, or Congress gets too far involved, we see an over-politicization of foreign policy, and that leads us to a dangerous issue where we don't have the ability to act 
uh, with the utmost urgency in specific cases. Yeah, but but, but the but the Constitution clearly envisions a role for Congress in foreign policy. In response to that, the Curtis Wright decision indicates that, uh, of course, like every other government of power must be exercised in subordination to the applicable provisions of the Constitution. It is to be avoided in success for aims achieved congressional legislation, which is to be made effective through negotiation and inquiry. Within the international field, must often accord to the president a degree of discretion and freedom. Now, referring to Justice Sutherland and our interpretation of this, means that, that Congress can pass specific legislative reforms or rules and laws in which the president should, to some extent, follow, but also discretion should be granted to the president in circumstances of national security. We're going to go back to the previous argument that we articulated that the Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1925, 1995, with the executive waiver uh, placed within it, for the Congress, Congress to postpone action in regards to Jerusalem based on the bias of national security means that the Congress has seen its ability to interfere in regards to this. The fact but, that but, but isn't this factually distinct, Counselor? There's, there's something materially different about placing an embassy in a particular city, this city being Jerusalem, and what your uh, counsel on the other side has argued, which is this is just allowing an individual who was born in Jerusalem to put on their, pa their personal passport that they were born in Israel. Those are very, very different acts. But in both situations, we see that the issue is not a personal one. We're not talking about just this individual. And the petitioners claim that this is only going to affect a small number of Americans. Uh, we have to contest that. Because though it might only affect a small number of individuals in changing their passport and changing what it says on their passport, the overarching effects are much greater and affect not only United States citizens but allies abroad. And what we see because of this is this is not an issue that's only going to the heart of a few people but something that will affect more people by looking at the political issues that could arise in this specific incident and other incidents. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Counselor, but what does this have to do with the recognition power? We're talking about passports here. So, first of all, Peggy Aggie indicates that in the situation where national security is indicated, the Congress uh, executive branch does have some unilateral action in regards to issuing the passport. To quote um, Secretary of State John Kerry in regards uh, to the, the Zivotofsky v. Kerry case that's occurring right now, the policy reflects the executive's assessment that any unilateral action by the United States that would single symbolically or concretely that it recognizes that Jerusalem is a city that is located within the sovereign nation of Israel would critically compromise the ability of the United States to work with Israelis, Palestinians, and others in the region to further peace process. And as the petitioner already claimed, there is no corollary, there is no way in which an individual can place Palestine as their state of birth if they were born in Jerusalem only Israel as their state of birth, which means that it would appear as if the United States is finally reversing its foreign policy from the Truman Doctrine, which has a, which has a risk to exacerbate geopolitical conflict in an area that's already right with it. Thank you. I, I have one more question I, with respect to another element uh, of, your, of your argument, and you seem to suggest that Congress has really never contested the President's recognition authority. Uh, does this history bear that out? Well, what we see is there have been contests made against the president, but in the majority of cases we've seen, we've seen the Supreme Court as far as the Constitution is concerned, siding with the president. And because of this, uh, with the president, and because of this, what we see is a historical ratification in which the president has been the sole entity to deal with the majority of foreign policy issues. We see that Congress does have the ability to also input, but it specifically says within the Constitution that Congress is to act as more of an advice, advisory, advisory role towards the president rather than one that makes sole uh, decisions for the nation. Okay, thank you. So, Counselor, if I may ask a question uh, as well, um, you keep saying that you know the situation in Israel is tense, and you know we we know this. We read the newspapers like anyone else. But is that really the job of the courts to consider? Isn't our job to expound on the Constitution, as John Marshall said 200 years ago? Why, why should we be considering the impacts of foreign policy? Shouldn't we be looking at that in purely terms of the separation of powers? Do we even have the competency to decide these sorts of matters? So in regards to the, uh, reauthor the Reauthorization Act 214D that the petitioner brings up, President Bush issued a statement that uh, the, he deemed the Congress's role as merely advisory, saying that it intermittently interferes with the President's constitutional authority. And the U.S. Constitution reserved the conduct of foreign policy to the President and resolutions 
Congress, what we're indicating that in the situation where Congress uh, tries to take this power or tries to acquiesce more power than it originally had, this would lead to a violation of the current separation of powers, which brings us inherently back to a constitutional issue. But we also uh, have reason to believe in the text of the Constitution that this power is specifically given to the president or specifically withheld from Congress to indicate that this is the way that power is supposed to be parsed between the two branches. And co uh, Counselor, if I can ask a follow-up, what is his signing statement? If the president thought this law is unconstitutional, why didn't he veto it? So, uh, so what Bush said is that the, he believed that the interpretation or the way in which he read the bill was primarily based as an advisory role, and he articulated that he would refuse to follow through in the situation where they were able to comply. I can't speak directly for Bush's intent or the reason why he chose to do this, but this is the signed statement that he put out, and this is what he said in regards to the bill, and this is the position that the executive branch believes is... Uh, Right. No, I, oh, I understand the president viewed as advisory, but if you read it and I read it, we read it the exact same way. This was not advisory. Congress was telling the president or the secretary of state more specifically, here is what you should do. This wasn't a suggestion. If the president viewed this as an unconstitutional infringement upon his uh, power, why wasn't there a veto? Why, why? I mean, the president has that power. He could have vetoed it. I mean, wh why are we even listening to these signing statements? They have no, they have no weight in law. Well, if we look at how signing statements have been used and utilized historically within the United States, though they might not act as law and might not act as strict uh, interpretations of the Constitution, what we see is we also have to acknowledge the fact that constitutional amendation does not necessarily occur with a specific amendment, but we also have to look at the changing times within the nation and how we've changed uh, our interpretations of the Constitution as time has gone on, especially when dealing with specific issues that have had such volatile implications, such as with Israel and Palestine. Uh, perhaps, like my uh, partner said, we can't speak to the correct reason why Vita did not occur, but if we look at the specific case and see how volatile the political issue is with Israel, and Pal uh, Israel Jerusalem, and Palestine, how contested this area is, uh, that might be the sole reason why a veto was, did not occur because of the overly political nature of this issue. But if we look to other issues, this might not be as uh, big of, a, uh, of an issue if we're looking at changing the capital uh, of a specific place and changing the passport. But in this specific case, this is a huge issue, and that alone might be a reason to be there not occur. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, how, are we, how are we doing on time? Can I ask another question? Yeah, Justice Silver, we have time for that. One more question. Great. So here's my last question for you. Uh, you argue that because Congress, uh, in your view, historically, uh, has not challenged the president with respect to certain foreign policy powers, that we should assume that this means that the constitutional balance of powers has changed. But the text seems to split foreign policy powers between those two branches of government. So why isn't it okay for Congress to now assert that authority? Well, we're articulating that there's a couple of Supreme Court precedent that indicates that this is the way that the Constitution has been interpreted, both in the signing statement, both in the uh, dictum that was put out by Hagee, Hagee, and Curtis B. Wright. We're also articulating that the way in which the Constitution was phrased explicitly gave certain executive power to the congressional branch in regard to foreign policy options and reserved the rest for the Constitution. We're also articulating that the situation where Congress cedes part of its authority to the president with the executive waiver in the Jerusalem Embassy Act and the fact that they have failed to subsequently amend this to remove the Executive Waiver Act, Act in years past, as is evidenced by the act that was attempt that I tr tried to pass but through the House Subcommittee in 2011, but didn't. Counselor, so my, I, you have mentioned this before, but, but my question is different. Just because they've ceded power in the past, why does that mean that now that all of that power is now vested uh, in the president? Why can't Congress now say, actually, we do have the authority, and we're going to assert it in this context? Well, as my partner said, they would have to go through a process of amendation. If we were to follow the current laws and the current sets of standards that have been set in place by Congress, the president is within their authority to go and take the legal actions that they've taken. If an amendation occurred, but as we've seen in the past in 2011 where it failed to be amended, we would see that uh, very different uh, case at hand. But that ultimately did not occur, and Congress did see this power. And under legal precedent set by Congress and the Supreme Court, the power is vested within Thank you. Okay, unless there are other questions, Justice Silverbrook, we, uh, we thank the respondents for their arguments. Um, uh, petitioner, you have about five minutes, offering a rebuttal that you uh, 
uh, that you wish. Thank you very much, guys. Okay, Councillor, whenever you're ready to proceed, you may. All right. So, in their argument, the respondents stated that um, the there is no power, Congress's power over recognition is not implied in the Constitution. I would refer back to the points I made in my uh, session of Congress's power over war and Congress's ability to confirm treaties show that you know, which these issues have an effect on recognition and Congress's ability to have oversight over war, to have oversight over treaties and to declare war, state that Congress also has oversight over the recognition. Furthermore, to address the respondents' national security concerns. Again, you would state that this law is representative of individual choice and not national policy. Furthermore, it's been in place for many years in which the foreign relations, the relationship between the United States and states, including Israel and its neighbors, have not been utterly wrecked. And also, another interesting point is that birth records are in fact issued by Israel. Uh, and as such, this, if it recognized anything, it would simply recognize Israel's authority over municipal concerns. Again, we point to the fact that Bush signed this act into law while maintaining the foreign relations policy that the executive branch still maintains. Councillor, if I, if I may interrupt you, how, how do you respond uh, to your opposing counsel's claim that Congress has really ceded all of this authority to the President and so it's no longer appropriate for them to try to assert themselves in this sphere? Well, I would point to an argument made by Professor Ryan Stein when he wrote that congressional inaction, particularly when combined with judicial dicta and scholarly commentary, can be used to infer legislative support for implied executive power. But past congressional inaction is not a necessary prologue for future congressional application. If recognition is a power shared by two branches, Congress can control and override exercises of that power by the executive, no matter how long it's acquiesced in the past. And the respondent pointed to cases, a case, Page v. Aggie. Um, and we would argue that the court's opinions in Zemel v. Rusk, where it states in Hank v. Aggie, contain notable dicta to support the extensive executive task force authority. However, rulings in these cases hinge on whether the standard of tacit congressional approval for an executive action is satisfied. While Congress may endorse the underlying premise of executive authority in the areas of foreign policy and national security, Congress but still retains the ability to regulate passports, which is an inviolable right to regulate all aspects of national protection. Okay. Thank you. And, Counselor, if I can ask you one last question in your remaining time. Um, your friends made an important point. They said in certain cases, the framers made clear Congress's role, for example, declaration of war. But where the framers did not make this clear, I guess it's a safe assumption that Congress has no role. Um, how would you respond to that argument from your, your opposing counsel? Do you repeat your question, please? Oh, I'm sorry. My question was this. In certain places, the Constitution makes clear Congress shares the role with the President. For example, declaration of war. Congress declares war, the President fights it, right? Mm -hmm. So your, co -count, your opposing counsel said, only where it's specifically listed does Congress share the power with the President. Where it's not listed, that means it's solely for the executive. How would you respond to that argument? I would point to the fact that the recognition power itself, itself is not explicitly stated in the Constitution. It's implied. Congress's um, ability to have oversight over the President's recognition power is also implied. Congress's powers must be explicitly stated, and perhaps the President's must be as well. Right, but we... we, we, we you know, if, with that argument, then there is no recognition power. If you're saying that it's implied, maybe it doesn't even exist. Maybe we've been wrong this entire time, and there is no recognition power uh, by Congress. It's all for the president. In 
since we function as a country, uh, we, we, can, we can see that the president does indeed possess the recognition power. Without that power, we cannot function in foreign affairs. However, that does not mean that Congress does not have oversight over this power. Okay, Counselor, I think your time is sped up. Uh, thank you very much, Counselor. You may be seated. So, uh, on behalf of uh, Justice Silverbrook and myself, we'd like to thank both of you and to the students at Oswego. Uh, you both did an excellent job. You should be commended for your work and for your uh, commitment to our Constitution. And we'll be in touch shortly, probably by the end of this weekend, with the results. And we will announce who will advance next round. And we hope you can continue to participate and uh, 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 maybe even win and attend our uh, Constitution Day celebration in DC in September. Thank you so much. And Justice Silverbrook, do you have any, uh, any closing remarks? I, I just want to congratulate uh, both teams here. You did a really fabulous job. Um, and you responded very well to a series of questions. You did a nice job citing uh, both legal and historical authorities, which is something that we do actually evaluate you on. Um, and I hope you learned a lot about the Constitution and the intricacies of this particular case, uh, which I do think is uh, significant. So thank you, thank you so much for participating, and I hope you enjoyed this as much as we did. Okay. Thank you. All um, right. Uh, qu 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 right. Ready. Quarters adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.